Hi guys, it is a cold, gray, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here in Austin, Texas, here in early November 2019, and this is Sam Mitchell from Collapse Chronicles, and we are going to head east today. We're going to go over to Charlottesville, Virginia, where I have the great pleasure and honor of speaking with this fellow named Justin McBrien, which might be a name you're not familiar with. Justin McBrien is is fairly new uh, down here in this rabbit hole uh, to a lot of us. He is a young man of 34, one, one of our younger members I have, I have ever interviewed here. And Justin... Just to give a, a brief background, Justin McBrien is a Ph.D. candidate in Modern American Environmental and Political History at the University of Virginia. He is the recipient of the 2018 University of Virginia Dr. Frank Finger Graduate Fellowship for Teaching, and he has written several articles on the history of climate change including a recent piece in the Washington Post. Justin received his B.A. from the University of Pennsylvania and his M.A. in History from the University of Virginia. And with that short introduction, Justin, come come on to Collapse Chronicles and say hello to the folks, and we're just going to dive right into this conversation. Uh, great. Well... Thank you so much, Sam, for having me on, and hello to all of your listeners. I really appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with you. Um, very excited about it. So. Okay, well, just to uh, remind people, you may have heard this uh, article. I read this, and I and I know some of my uh, fellows down down here in the Doomosphere also shared this excellent story. That came out in Truth Out a few weeks ago titled, This Is Not the Sixth Extinction. It is the first extermination event. And I'm just going to read the first couple of paragraphs as a launch pad into this. And we're just going to dive into it. So this is how Justin starts off his article from the insect apocalypse to the biological annihilation of 60% of all wild animals in the past 50 years, life is careening across every planetary boundary that might stop it from experiencing a great dying once more. But the atrocity unfolding in the Amazon and across the earth has no geological analog. To call it the sixth extinction event is to make what is an active, organized eradication sound like some kind of passive accident. This is no asteroid or volcanic eruption or slow accumulation of oxygen in the atmosphere. We are in the midst of the first extermination event, the process by which capital has pushed the earth to the brink of the necrocene, the age of the new necrotic death. Wow. There, there you go. And it, and it goes on from there, guys. Uh, and I will put the link to this and some other writings of Justin. But, but Justin, just give us a uh, talk for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to come back for some definitions about how, what brought about uh, th this rant. Um, okay, well, several things uh, that this rant was kind of the end product of um, a lot of other ranting I was doing in much more cloistered contexts of academic jargonese. So I felt I needed to finally say this in much more stark terms, I suppose, than what is sometimes acceptable uh, within those confines of those institutions. Um but to me, uh, coming from the position of studying extinction for 
many years, you know, over a decade now, uh, I became increasingly frustrated with how the term extinction was being applied to what was occurring today. You know, when we say the about we are the asteroid, as Elizabeth Colbert said in her famous book on the sixth extinction, uh, is, is to imply that this is somehow a natural occurrence that could be put into the pantheon of geological time, similar to other events in life's history, uh, considered now, right, the five mass extinction events. Um, so I was getting a little frustrated with what I saw as a form of almost sanitization of what was happening today, and that you could not really account for what is occurring right now as something similar to past extinction events, mostly brought about by the actions of, you know, non-agent forces, i.e. volcanoes, asteroids, or even the accumulation of oxygen due to cyanobacterial photosynthesis. You could say a species drove this event. Uh, at the same time, this is not an intentional act of exploitation like we see today. So I kind of just became fed up. And once the Extinction Rebellion came around, I saw it as an opportunity to really start trying to reframe what we're talking about when we talk about Extinction today. So okay, that's so, really where the rant originally came from. All right. Uh, well, let, let, let's have a few definitions. Uh, I've, I've talked to many people about the Anthropocene. I, I think everyone has, has probably heard the term the Anthropocene. I want to get your views on that. But then a couple of times I have mentioned this, uh, th th this whole notion of the Capitalocene. And you have now even introduced a third term called the Necrocene. So we need a, just a, 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 a few working definitions. And I, and I think before you get into the various scenes, I want to hear just your definition of the word capital since it's going to be so such a big part of this discussion. So define capital for us and, and connect the dots between capital and the Anthropocene, the Capitalocene, and what you call the Necrocene, is, is, if that's not too much of a mouthful for you to bite off there. Oh, no, not at all. Um, well, first, uh, when we talk about capital, uh, the way I'm using it is basically just the means by which you purchase one commodity in order to sell it again at uh, to, in order to realize a profit from it. Uh, that is the most basic definition of capital. That is not what capital ends up becoming. And um, in Marx's terminology, there are various types of capital. And today we could say most of the capital we see circulating is fictitious. Uh, it is not based upon any kind of connection to material production. Uh, but right now, I would say if we want to use it in the context of what I'm referring to, it is the means by which uh, we seek to extract surplus or profit from a commodity uh, and then to then reinvest that profit in order to continue to valorize uh, capital and, again, to uh, continue to accumulate profit. So that, I would say, at the most basic level is what I we could say capital is. I don't really want to spend too much time yeah, going we, into yeah. constant capital, variable capital, et cetera, et cetera. That's so why I wanted just the yeah. definition. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I think if I understand your, your main, I mean, you have many points that you raise, but I think the main one you're raising is that you put more of the blame for the first extermination event on the actual system of capitalism rather than blaming the human nature itself under the Anthropocene. So before we even get into the Necrocene, compare and contrast your understanding of the Anthropocene versus the Capitalocene, 
and then we will uh, get from there into the necro scene, which is the bulk of what you talk about. So let's start with the anthropocene. What's right and wrong about that term? Uh, well, the anthropocene, um, as I'm sure you've kind of talked to other people about, is a term that was mostly originally coined by Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer uh, in 2002. Um, and they were in a conference and supposedly Crutzen blurted it out that it's not the Holocene, but the Anthropocene. And basically it just means that is the geological epoch of humanity, that human beings have uh, done such extensive transformation to the earth that they now warrant their own eponymous geological epoch. And there has been dispute, of course, over when the what is called the GSSP or golden spike, the point uh, that would stratigraphically confirm this change, uh, has been up for debate for some time, but it appears that the Anthropocene Working Group is converging upon around 1950 uh, to place this date uh, or this golden spike. And due to a combination of alterations in the biogeochemical cycles of carbon, nitrogen, etc., the uh, massive growth of energy consumption, nuclear weapons testing, plastic pollution, all these things go under the heading of what is called the Great Acceleration. Um, nuclear weapons testing, not so much, but it's actually very much part of the system, but we would put that separate from the Great Acceleration concept. So that is the Anthropocene, is really the idea that human beings have now transform the earth to the point where we are in a new geological epoch. Okay, do you, uh, do you ac 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 accept all of that, reject all of that, or are you on board with some of it, but you think they're missing some big yeah, points? So I've like evolved a bit on this, um, and I would say, and I could come back to this, uh, I would now say that I think uh, I would like to exit the scene scene generally and think that um, the whole debate, whether it is the Anthropocene or the Capitalocene or the Necrocene, uh, to me is perhaps beside the point. But um, with the Anthropocene, I'll, I'll say this, that um, I have long argue that nuclear weapons testing was and really the creation of nuclear weapons was one of the most like fundamental ruptures in human history. Um, and so I can't say I wasn't perversely um, satisfied to see that it seemed to be converging upon what's called the 1964 bomb spike, which was, you know, after a decade of atmospheric nuclear weapons testing, we, spread things like strontium-90 and carbon-14 around the Earth. Um, and uh, so I agree in many ways with the scientific basis for the Anthropocene, particularly being determined at around 1950. Uh, so I, I am in entire agreement with that generally. Now, um, what I think is the agent behind this, I am in much disagreement about. Uh, and I think that's where the Capitalocene comes in. And the Capitalocene really actually places the start of this at technically, you could say, 1610, which is what was called the CO2 minima. And uh, the geographers, uh, Lewis and Maslin, argue that the 1610 CO2 minima caused by a combination, partially the demographic collapse in the Americas, uh, and of course natural events uh, that sort of spurred the Little Ice Age, uh, came together in 1610 to have one of the lowest points of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, I don't think this really obtains as a definition of a golden spike. However, uh, the Capitalocene advocates want to say that that is beside the point, that if we were to talk about how we got to the point where we are transitioning to a new geological epoch, to use the term humanity to describe that uh, the impact of the do basically ascribe the agency to humanity is to ignore the vast inequalities 
historically and contemporarily that uh, structure this event and continue to drive it. So uh, the placement of the beginning of whatever scene this is in the 17th-ish century after the contact with the Americas reinterprets the entire idea around uh, capitalism structuring what Jason W. Moore calls a world ecology and that this world ecology eventually culminated in this geological scale impact. Um, so that is kind of, in a lot of ways, the capital O scene replaces the anthropos with the capital O is a lot of ways what is going on there. Um, I am sympathetic to that as well. Um, but I've found that with the Anthropocene debate in general, there is something of a, you could say a double bind uh, between the imperative of having to scientifically determine a moment and having to historically and socially contextualize that moment. Wherever you draw that boundary point, you're again going to have to, in a certain way, say that the things that occurred before that are not part of that, even if we all know they led to that, yeah. right? So you're stuck in a situation between a diachronous and synchronous kind of uh, concept of what the Anthropocene or scene is. At a certain point, I start seeing this as more a redescription of old ideas of modernity, kind of with a new geo-ecological twist. Um, and that was why, uh, when I originally was critiquing the Anthropocene with the Necrocene, it was uh, a bit tongue-in-cheek at first. Um, it, it not tongue-in-cheek in the sense of, uh, I thought it was a joke, but the necro scene was supposed to really evoke the horror, the affective horror of what's happening that I thought the other concepts are a bit too innocuous to truly do. And that the necro scene, if we want to talk about whatever this scene is, what is actually important here? Well, it's extinction. And this extinction has been accelerating since about the time that the capital of scene has been placed uh, around, you know, the post-contact Colombian exchange, homogenization of equatorial regions around the growing of a few staple crops, destruction of indigenous ecologies, peoples and species, etc. cetera. Um, if we start at that point and looked up onward to the present, the main problematic we're dealing with is extinction. And so for me, it's not a question about when humanity or capital, et cetera, became geological, but rather how this becoming is a becoming extinction. And that that is the problem we must deal with. And that extinction needs to be looked at as not part of the climate crisis or part of an ecological crisis, but like the great structuring principle of all of them. And that was why I wanted to redefine the entire scene debate around extinction, mass extinction, and at, acting more as a boundary event than it would be a stratigraphic golden spike that there's no point where we could just pause and say, here we go, yeah. here it is. Now, Peter Brennan um, came out with a great article not too long ago called against the Anthropocene, uh, which furthered my thinking on how, because the Anthropocene is itself um mostly projected into the future, right? We are at the beginning of this. Most of the time we talk about geological time, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of years in terms of uh, many of these extinction events. Uh, you know, these processes unfold at much larger rate than us debating whether it's 1945 or 1610. From the deep time perspective of the future, no one's going to be able to tell the difference between these things. You know, yeah. um, they're, they're just not they're, they're not going to be able to be separated. I mean, perhaps we'll, some alien will have the techniques to do so. But let's just say that that's not really the case. So the question is really, well, what is the. It's fighting extinction, so. Okay, so we're still, <laughs> well, well, but before we continue, let, let's, get the, let, let's get your definition of the necrocene, which will obviously incorporate the, the definition of necrosis. Yes. So what well, are we talking um, about here? 
Well, the necro scene uh, is double, both meaning death and necrosis, um, and using the scene also in the sense of new. So it is a new necrotic death, and I new death meaning a death unlike that we've seen on the planet before. So it is not such like a previous mass extinction event. And this death is caused by a type of necrosis being perpetrated by the logic of capital accumulation. Which so must define, necessarily... define necrosis for the folks listening who are Well, necrosis, I mean, basically is a means by which uh, cells eat themselves alive, um, <laughs> right? Cell replacement as apoptosis is a normal natural process, whereas necrosis is a traumatic injury. It is not replaced, right? It, it is simply um, permanently scarred and erased. So necrosis is a form of uh, eating up without any kind of replacement, I suppose, if yeah. that makes sense. Um, that is how I believe the logic of capital operates. Um, and so the necrotic aspect, it is necessarily needs to constantly be uh, destroying and driving to extinction that which is around it in order to continue its own survival. So it's planet eating. We're in the age of planet eating. Yes, and it eats itself. And I think that's what's important uh, about this, is that um, it is not simply eating things around it. Um, it. It must always be as well eating itself. Uh, if that we look at, for instance, um, what is happening today, right now, um, and we talk a lot about, you know, uh, this kind of idea that, oh, capitalism is searching for endless growth, endless accumulation, et cetera. In a certain sense, I think that's correct. But in another sense, I think that really it doesn't need to grow, per se. It just needs to figure out a way to profit. So it can profit from its own destruction and its own destruction of itself as much as it can profit from itself growing. Uh, I mean, the 2008 financial collapse is a, is a good, you know, good way to show in just in terms of economics that uh, this did not harm the operations of global capitalism. In fact, if anyone made out from this very catastrophe, it was the people who caused it. So they don't necessarily uh, need to be growing in order to consume and accumulate, right? Um, so I think that needs to be kind of slightly parsed. Does that make sense? Uh, I feel there's needs to be a parsing there between this idea that capitalism just sort of cancerous expansion versus a kind of necrosis that uh, does not necessarily imply expansion all the time. It can equally imply contraction. Well, so I mean, what's the ultimate uh, the, the ultimate outcome of, of the necro scene that uh, that that capitalism in, in the process of eating the planet is going to eat itself and it, and it's all coming down together? Well, that uh, is somewhat part of it, but I think it's also part of what capitalism wants everyone to believe that it's either it's going to take everyone down with it. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm skeptical entirely of the one-to-one -one correspondence between the destruction of capitalism and uh, the kind of environmental degradation it's wreaking. You know, a lot of people today kind of see what it's doing is driving its own destruction. Now, I think that's possible, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. And that's, I think, what I'm trying to distinguish is the, the major issue I think that we need to confront is how is it that capitalism, excuse this alliteration, consistently capitalizes on its own catastrophes, right? It can commodify its extinction just as easily as it can create commodities from driving extinction. It is not necessarily going to be doomed 
uh, by environmental degradation to an extreme degree. I, I mean, you can point to, I think it'd be just as happy living in a soylent green world as long as it could keep growing people and eating them. So I, I don't necessarily think that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between environmental degradation and collapse and the end of capitalism. I do think it presents a major opportunity uh, excuse that term. I actually am going to retract that. Um, it presents uh, a crisis in its accumulation that can facilitate its downfall, but I don't think it's necessarily the case. Um, so I, I, you, I, this could get way, way worse uh, before capitalism disappears from the face of the earth. It could and will, and, and and I read, but when you say it could, that it probably will. In in your in your view of oh yeah, and I mean that's why with the Necro scene, um, I backtracked on it a bit, and now argue it is still underdetermined. And to me, that's the same with the entire scene concept: is that this is all still underdetermined as to what actually is happening right now, which is why I believe it needed to be called a first extermination event and not the sixth extinction event. because so we don't understand what the future of this is going to be. And uh, we do see what is happening in the present and there is already horror and has been all around us. And that, to me, is what needs to be confronted. And we don't entirely understand the long, deep time implications of what's occurring today. Um, so we cannot really right now say, you know, in uh, a million years, perhaps if someone proposed uh, the idea of, uh, I can't remember who it was, the Gallicene, that maybe the alien observer comes in a million oh. years and sees trillions of chicken bones everywhere and assumes that they rule the oh, earth. Oh, I was, uh, yeah, I was just, ha who was I having that conversation with just recently? I talked to so many people. Well, whomever, you know, so you, uh, someone could come down a long time yeah. from now and think that, that the gallus gallus chicken was <laughs> the, the cause of all of this. So um, there, there's really, it's all underdetermined. It's all in the future. And I guess I've been more and more wanting to dispense with these kind of futurological thought exercises for what we are seeing in front of our faces. Um, and that is, again, why for me the first extermination is about the here and now we yeah. witness today. Um, yes. Okay, this whole t you, you, you briefly mentioned it, but you, you write about it uh, a lot. The whole term catastrophism, I, I, lo I love that word since I am uh, a catastrophist myself, I guess, are, d again, is to define catastrophism and are you a catastrophist? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I, well, I'm a, you could say that I'm a vacillating catastrophist. Um, <laughs> You're a catastrophist on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, all, it's all about mood, right? No, um, the uh, catastrophism means several different things. Uh, catastrophism proper, uh, in terms of, uh, geology, uh, really begins with Georges Cuvier in the uh, early 19th century, the person who basically uh, dis uh, discovered extinction is not the correct term, but he proposed yeah. uh, the concept that species go extinct in this famous talk in 1796 on the woolly mammoth. Um, and he proposed the idea, and is very familiar now, that exogenous geological events um, – such as, let's say, an asteroid can drive previously robust and adapted species to extinction. Now, of course, Cuvier didn't believe in evolution, so he was missing half of the equation there. But um, the evolutionists who ended up kind of critiquing and, you know, he, uh, for good reasons, he was at heart a theologian who was trying to fit this entire idea into 5,000 years of biblical history um, – they dismissed catastrophism because of the fact that it was so tied up with these kind of theological principles people wanted to leave by the wayside. So then 
evolution became centered around tiny accumulative changes over the course of deep time in a very continuous, slowly evolving manner. Obviously, that is true, too. Um, but in the mid-20th century, the reevaluation of this comes most famously uh, with the idea of punctuated equilibrium. And we start seeing uh, more arguments that the geological and biological evolutionary history on Earth is punctuated by cataclysms uh, that cause rapid collapse in species and then also points of rapid flourishing and diversification of species and that evolution is not a constant. So that's a very scientific background of the geology of catastrophism. Now, catastrophism on the other side as a cultural concept, um, I argue has to do with a certain precept that human beings are a sort of parasitic divine parasite or virus godlike agent through their innate nature has uh, come to drive uh, the total planetary collapse of life on earth uh, and that this is an inevitable outcome of human nature and social organization um, so those two forms of catastrophism I see merge into one larger complex by the mid 20th century with uh, the rise of the kind of contemporary environmental movement in the 1950s and 60s combined with the rise of uh, climate science, nonlinear dynamical systems theory, uh, and a lot more attunement toward the idea that the planet is a highly sensitive and interlocking a uh, series of feedback loops that can easily be disrupted and sent creating and cascading in another direction, something which for most of human history, people believe to be beyond the power of human beings. Um, now, I believe a lot of this uh, is true. I ascribe to the all the scientific precepts behind this. So I, I it's not, to me, derogatory only in the sense that then it becomes appropriated as this kind of... Um, resigned pessimism to uh, our inevitable end due to our inherent nature. Um, and that, I think, is used as a means to continue to go down the track that we're on now by saying that there is really no hope that uh, civilization must necessarily collapse and that we you know, are predestined almost uh, for this, you know, violent, bloody, destructive end, uh, a tragedy of our own doing. And so you do not. So you it, it sounds like you're you started out in agreement with and, and I'll my guess, Justin, is a whole lot of people listening to this will be in that camp. Uh, and it sounds like you started out gently saying you agree with a lot of it, but you you do not think that the collapse of civilization and more worryingly the, the entire planet is built into the cards it just as a, a, a as a final outcome of, of, of human nature that we're getting what we deserve. You're, you're not quite ready to uh, to go there. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, I, I'm not ready to go there in the sense of I see it as a, as a partially holdout uh, to a, an older kind of religious principle of um, a theodicy, right? A, a justification uh, for the evils of the world due to there's going to be a moment of kind of reckoning uh, in which we pay for our sins. And I, I don't think that, I, I guess maybe as a historian, I, I'm not one to, I don't like being so overgeneralizing about terms such as nature and civilization. I think human beings have been a lot of things and can be many more. And so I don't necessarily deny the possibilities of what people are saying by any means. Most of the time, I'm actually utterly terrified by the future. Um, so I in no way mean to be downplaying that. But I do want to downplay, not downplay, I do want to critique this idea about 
some sort of innate human nature being the cause of this. And that I think we need to look at this with much more historical specificity to what we as supposed human beings are doing to the planet versus what organizations socially we are subsumed under that are maybe doing this to the planet. And that's for me to say that all human beings by their nature are kind of destructive parasites uh, is not only, I think, leads to some very troubling conclusions about solutions to this issue, uh, but it also is unfair to most of the people on the planet whose fault has they, they are of virtually no fault for what has occurred right now, you know? Um, so I, I just don't think it's uh, – I think it indulges too much in, in an abstraction uh, that does not allow us to really get at how we are, in fact, really uh, going to – if we're going to try to stop this, uh, what we need to do to stop it. If it's human beings innately as destructive agents, then I guess there is nothing but to just fiddle while it burns, perhaps. But um, And that's, to me, why I'm resistant to it. Uh, it is because I want to, however perhaps futile, many people might think or that it may be i I would like to at least try and believe that we can find other ways to exist um okay (laughs) is it is is, vague vague. uh you know i'm I'm reminded of kafka's line about yes there is hope infinite hope but not for us um (laughs) so uh, I, I do, you know, I, I have to say that I, I do waver between this feeling of being overwhelmed by there seemingly being an intractability to what's occurring versus my kind of historical awareness that there's been a very long line of this kind of argumentation that has not been borne out or has been used to justify some very disturbing things. So that's where uh, I kind of come down on it. I am a. I'm a catastrophist who does not believe in the inevitability of total catastrophe, if that makes sense. Okay, so is it <laughs> as, well, I, I, I shudder to use the word simple, I, is it a matter of just getting rid of capitalism? I, I mean, we we weren't capitalists in, until when? He's 1610, I guess, uh, you know what I'm yeah. saying. Is it is it a matter of getting rid of capitalism? Is that what you're suggesting? And if you are suggesting that, how do you suggest we do that? And what ism are we going to replace it with? Yeah. Well, okay. First, with the ism, what ism are we going to replace it with? I'd like to separate, um, let's just say, these two things from each other, because I think this is partially how things get quickly into like uh, a state of talking past. Not that I'm saying with you, but the ism to replace it versus the diagnostics of what is causing it are are different arguments, right? So when we talk about the diagnostic, that's capitalism. To me, if we want to look historically from the time that background rates of extinction began to accelerate – around 1610 to what we see in the present and the rapid acceleration since 1950. uh, This must be historically counted for primarily due to the expansion of capitalism and the logic of accumulation and surplus extraction that must necessarily leave in its path uh, the exploitation of human beings, species, and the earth itself Uh, to the point where it uses it all up and moves on, right? And it is running out of cheap natures uh, really to use up today. And so it will more and more be eating itself as time goes on. Soylent green-like, I suppose. But capitalism, to me, is not the be-all and end-all of us solving our ecological crisis. It is the major impediment, I believe, to beginning to do that, not the end point at which once it is dismantled, everyone can kumbaya. I I don't 
think that is the case. However, I don't see us even getting close to some kind of kumbaya without first dealing with capitalism as the major impediment to dealing in any way with any of the ecological problems we're dealing with. And obviously everyone likes to reduce things. Not everyone, I don't want to be generalizing, but there is a lot of conflation of many different types of ecological crises under the climate crisis. And we know when it comes to biodiversity loss, that's actually not the main driver of biodiversity loss. Uh, so when we talk about, say, the Green New Deal, which has its, I have a lot of people I know who are very deeply invested and involved in that. And um, I, I don't want to spend too much time on on the uh, my my issues with it, um, but I, I will say that that doesn't the, that will not solve a lot of the problems that we're seeing today, right? And and even the development of renewable energies just create new extractive industries, which will continue exploitation of people and will continue the degradation of environments. So I, I don't see simply this kind of you know, uh, eco-socialist decarbonization program as somehow going to deliver us from all evil. Yeah. At the same time, I don't see how without uh, the destruction of a logic of a system that necessarily must constantly seek to profit and extract more and more from nothing, uh, and that in the past 30 years has basically been captured by people who should be tried for crimes against humanity for knowing full well yeah. what they've been doing. Uh, you know, I, it, to me, the there's no there's no way we're going to get anywhere until uh, we expropriate all fossil fuel resources. We expropriate the uh, budget of uh, the Pentagon that we begin to really just take over all communal resources. I only see that as the initial entry point to us starting to deal with this crisis. Um, but well, right that's now, the it's... initial starting point. I, I, I mean, good Lord, <laughs> brother. I, I mean, if that's your starting point. Uh, give give us give us some ideas. Uh, I mean, where is the first step uh, towards this great de decarbonization and decoupling and getting rid of capitalism? I I, I don't see it happening. Uh, I, I don't even see how we can get to, to step one. So, uh, yeah, I agree. I, I'm having trouble with that too. Um, you're doing, so you do very <laughs> well. The, 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 the Justin does very well on the diagnostics. I, I, I cannot find fault with much of his diagnostics, but we're, we're, we're waiting for your, your, your next, uh, as, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, having a little bit of fun with you here, Justin. Them, but you know what I'm saying. It's it's oh, yeah. it's a lot easier to diagnose the problem than to prescribe the uh, the you know the panacea that's gonna that's gonna get get us out of it. So what's well, the drug? We're, what's the new drug? If we get rid of fossil fuels, we need a new drug. Yes, exactly. Um, I don't think that's the thing that I'm trying to say. That there's no panacea uh, for this. I, I tentatively support the program of rapid decarbonization. I, I definitely think that there's really no other way around immediately doing that. And so my support in a certain sense has to be behind the Green New Deal. However, I only see that as the first step and what I would like to see eventually are degrowth principles applied that would allow for an eventual decentralization and municipalization of control over energy and food resources uh, and a means by which we first get off fossil fuels and ensure that there is an equitable distribution of resources, and then we begin to try to devolve that centralized uh, process into a more localized, community-controlled 
uh, system of energy and food production. But there needs to be a transitional stage to that. And I worry the Green New Deal might be a Trojan horse to just save capitalism uh, or simply just another form of, uh, you know, extractive commodification. So I don't see that as necessarily being a panacea. But I do see right now that what is most necessary is, I think, seizing state power and getting power out of the hands of corporations that control majority of our resources. And doing that seems to me to be only immediately available through a program such as the Green New Deal. But uh, I see that as presenting another series of problems. So in the long run, my sympathies lie with the program of degrowth. But I don't see how we can jump from A to B without having to go through a transitional stage that involves state control and implementation of a decarbonization program. Do you see, uh, I don't that, see, do you see that, that realistically from, happening uh, from, from your vantage uh, point in academia that, that I don't see from my vantage point. Uh, did I say I think it's realistic? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, but the, the idea of it being realistic uh, is, is different than, uh, you know, um, it, proposing it. There's very few things, uh, I think, that seem to be, at this moment in time, very realistic. So, again, hence my understanding of catastrophism. But uh, while we are watching uh, this unfold, we still have to figure out at least some avenue of attack. And to me, a, a world um, that uh, is at least slightly... <laughs> Uh, slightly less destructive to the earth is what <laughs> the only kind of thing we can really hope for, I suppose, at the moment. But I agree with you that what is really realistic about any of this is, is very difficult to see. However, you don't really know, again, how the parameters of society and people's perceptions change. So we don't really know what will be considered realistic in 20 years versus what we consider realistic right now. And we don't know what's going to intervene in that time period to maybe change people's opinions. So I agree with you at this moment in time, trying to implement even a program that I see as a half measure, such as the Green New Deal, I see very little actionable ability to do so at this moment. But, I mean, what is our other option here to just kind of throw up our hands and, and say we're all going to die? I see that as something we can do while still trying to change it, you know? Yeah. I, I don't see how they need to be necessarily in opposition to each other. Okay, I need to. We are forty-eight <laughs> minutes in, so we we got uh, we we got ten minutes to cover at least two more subjects. Uh, okay, to, to switch gears a little bit, overpopulation or overconsumption? Which side of that uh, double-headed snake are you on, or do you see both heads of that one? Uh, I would have to say overconsumption, certainly, but obviously these two things have interrelations with each other. Um, but primarily, you know, when three billion people are uh, barely using, uh, you know, the resources of about 10 percent of the population, I, I just don't see how overpopulation it you have to ask who and where when you want to start talking about overpopulation i think um because i don't think that overpopulation in itself as an abstract concept is the major driving factor behind our crisis as much as certain populations and their consumptive practices i.e ours um so that, uh, I would say, I have to be on the side of overconsumption in that regard. Um, so I, I don't – the reason I have an issue with population discourse, as I think a, a lot of people are, are wary about, is that it, it lends itself right 
for the pickings of a eco-fascist um, argument that is regaining credence today and that I find rather disturbing. And that's not to imply that simply to talk about population is to do that. But it is to me to my leeriness about trying to point to population as what we need to tackle more than, say, the logic of accumulation is that then I ask, well, what what populations are we talking about? How do exactly do you want to reduce these populations? What what coercive measures do we need to put in check in order to do so? And a lot of times this leads eventually to certain populations are unfit, unable to properly manage resources, et cetera, et cetera, and they are stealing from other populations who are fit and can manage those resources. And if only they had uh, the ability to be let alone, that everything would work out. And so I, I just I find it very uh, disquieting, the long history of population discourse and environmental thought, which just oftentimes dovetails with people who are uh, either eugenicists or uh, strict anti-immigration advocates, uh, and the conclusions disturb me. So I, I generally feel that the discourse of overpopulation uh, is, is a politically dangerous one to focus on in terms of the many different aspects of this problem. It does, uh, it, 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 it does mud, muddy the waters. And uh, with, uh, as I say, I, I, this is not a debate platform between Sam Mitchell and, uh, and, and his guests. But oh, okay, I, we're, we're just we're we're just gonna move on, and I want to hit. The, no, I would actually, I would, I'd love to. I'd love to hear. Um, it, I, I mean, I'd love to hear what you have to say uh, about. Oh it. well, we're already fifty-two minutes, and people who know <laughs> me know what I have to say. But we're gonna wind up uh, with this from uh, one of your longer pieces. Okay, he was, uh, Justin was, ta I love this term, apocalyptic chic, you know, spelled C-H-I-C, and he had this quote, all this kind of literature, we're going to call it all this kind of doomer literature on our ecological crisis is the greatest victory for the ideology of necrotic capital today uh justin in three or in three minutes do you want to backpedal out of that or wait what were you meaning when you were were claiming that that the doomer literature was the greatest victory for the ideology of necrotic capital today the, the, them's fighting words for a lot of people listening uh, to this uh, well again <laughs> um i will say this with that article and when my book comes out <coughs> Based on this, there will be a lot more uh, room to have nuance than 1,200 words. Okay, uh, well, well, Patrick, give us about three well, minutes of nuance. I was going yeah. to say this, and apocalyptic chic is not my term. Um, it is, in fact, there's a, there's a, um, a book called Apocalyptic Chic edited by Barbara Broadman, and there's also a recent article that came out i can't remember i think it was in the chronicle of higher education um but regardless of that uh i was very specifically thinking of one book in particular by uh roy scranton i don't know if you're familiar yeah, with he will not be interviewed by me roy has uh we email regularly but i have not i have not reeled roy into collapse chronicles yet <laughs> yeah um so I, I see him as a, as a great example of this kind of all we have left to do is to just watch civilization collapse and, and learn how to die in the Anthropocene, etc. Um, and I, I, I don't think this argument has any like serves any real purpose aside from just letting what's happening continue because it seems too impossible to stop it right there is a frederick jameson had a quote 
that many people feel it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. And so this kind of apocalypticism about the end of the world by seeming that we're so trapped in a system of a, a kind of just uh, irreconcilable double bind and creating us toward the, the great moment of um, destruction, uh, I, I see... I see that as only serving the purposes of a system that tells us that there is no other way but this, and it's either this or collapse. So I think that we need to not not be catastrophist. We need to at least take that catastrophism with a grain of salt and to understand that, A, we don't we aren't living in the future past. We're living in the present progressive. What will have come to be, we do not know. And second, there's even if we do think that there is no way out, I don't see how there could possibly be any way out if we just decide to include there's, conclude there's no way out. So you can think there's no way out, but you can still try to still spend time searching for one, right? So I think that's what I'm trying to say is that this resignation principle that it's too late, uh, that we're doomed, et cetera, that it's not it just short circuits the ability of us to even attempt to begin to try to conceive of another ism or system out of the uh, collapse of whatever is coming right now. And so I don't want to uh downplay in any way what's occurring and how terrifying and horrifying it is and the atrocities being perpetrated today and what will probably continue. I in no way want to downplay that. I'm not one of these hopers, uh, if you will. Um, you know, I at the same time, though, don't see any reason why we shouldn't at least have some slim sen uh, slim uh, desire to overcome this and not succumb to the pessimism that has been the most useful, uh, affective mode for capitalism to continue doing what it's doing. Okay, well, I think you already answered my wrap-up question that I asked of every one of my guests, because we're getting ready to collapse here, so... Uh, Justin McBrien, if you were not talking to Sam Mitchell on Collapse Chronicles for one hour, but you had a 60-second soundbite to the mainstream media, to your the Justin McBrien message to the planet in late 2019, what would your 60 seconds sound like? Make it quick. Um, my 60-second soundbite? Yes. Uh, how about, uh, how about, uh... I, I suppose uh, my, I can make it a lot quicker than that. Uh, this is not humanity. It's capitalism. And uh, until we deal with that, then we are doomed. That's it. <laughs> there you go. I, I like that. I, I like the last three words. We are doomed on this channel. Anyway, <laughs> Justin McBride, uh, global industrial capitalism is ready to collapse in less than two minutes here. So I really want for the folks here listening to thank you very much for taking an hour out of your schedule for this entertaining and lively conversation and stick around after we hang up but uh for from every from me and everyone here we really appreciate your hard work and sharing your voice with the most important discussion on this planet and keep up the good work brother thank you so much really appreciate you having me on bye guys